This is not going to be a good talk. All right. Um, I am Ankur, and today we'll be talking about remediation, probably the most boring topic in security history. So bear with me while we go through this. Uh, when I started thinking about this topic, I came up with a couple of names for it. Uh, if you look at the Google Trends, then this seemed to be the one which would pick up the most ones. I put in risk, I put in agile, and I put in remediation. Frankly, this title makes no sense whatsoever. So this is what we really call it, which is essentially a comprehensive remediation program in as little as possible. i start off. Uh, I'm not a remediation person, per se. Um, I used to be a attacker. I used to try like breaking things. Uh, it was fun. I used to be very happy. People would give me things. I would break them. Lots of broken things. I would give them back. I would go back home a very, very happy young man. This is what I would look like at that point. Unfortunately, uh, things kept getting broken. And the more they kept getting broken, the less people were fixing them. It was more that the, nobody really wanted to do anything about it, or they didn't know what to do about it. Those who really wanted to do something about it tried doing it, they ended up doing it wrong. Again, these were not very happy times. People were really, really, really sad about this. So this was us. So with all this in mind, uh, we had a huge pile of findings, bugs, vulnerabilities, severities, whatever you want to call it. And we decided that we wanted to do something about it now going forward. So our first reaction, as is always normal, we decided we are going to fix everything now. We went and told our development teams, you need to be secure. Of course, they wanted to know what does being secure mean. So we come, came up with really, really, really thick sheets, really lots of reports, and some really badass screenshots showing that applications being completely owned, and told them, here, fix this. Now, um, fun thing's fun. Most people tended to go into two modes, panic or complete nonchalance. So in the panic mode, of course, you would have a bunch of developers coming to you and saying, we have no idea what to do. Tell us what to do now, please. Seriously, we need to get this out, otherwise we are not going to go into release. Yeah, um, not the best of reactions, unfortunately, and it also leads to no work getting done. The other one being complete non-challenge, and like, meh, so. And of course, this is the other side of the spectrum where essentially you have Nothing at all happening. So you get stuck there as well. So keeping all this, we decided, all right, we are going to try and formalize this. We are not just going to tell them fix everything. We will give them steps. We will give them processes. We will give them monkeys, for lack of better things. And so we came up with the words. We started calling them vulnerabilities. We call, started calling them findings. We started calling them a lot of different where did they come from? They came from other attackers. They came from reports. They came from automated tools. They came from other processes. They came from reviews. They came from everywhere. The only place they did not come from was the moon. But how did we know about them? Well, we had very, very, very knowledgeable people who had lots of time on their hands who essentially went about these things and started breaking them apart. And that's how they came to know about them. So normally, when the developer would essentially come up to you with the really, really wide eyes saying, how did this happen? You say, this is how it happened, yes. And then what happened to them? Well, in the ideal world, somebody would take them, fix them, and life would go on. This was not the ideal world. So essentially, these got relegated till something went really, really wrong. And at that point, somebody would dig this up from somewhere and essentially go, we told you so. Both those reactions, not the most classic ones, but we lived with them. And of course, the always the question that sticks around, will these things ever come back? Uh, more often than not, they did, which was also not a lot of fun. So how did we start? We started with the most basics of things. You give us things, we put them into buckets. We classified them. We called them different names. We called them lows. We called them mediums. We called them highs. And what we could not put into these three, we came up with pictures. 
And then we essentially decided to give them timelines. We told them fix those in 90 days, fix those in 60, fix those in 30. And some of the rest which you couldn't come up with, we just told them, seriously, fix it now. And we also built up a knowledge base where we told people, if you have this, you do that. You have process scripting, do output encoding on input validation. If you have process request forgery, start individualizing your requests. And of course, we built up huge libraries, we built up large knowledge bases, and things looked that they might actually almost get fixed. Unfortunately, some of the things that were not considered was the fact that people would then start developing something. They called it the agile. They called that lots of things. They called it extreme programming. They called, they called it Scrum. At the end, it was essentially programmers developing things really fast and often missing out on basic details or things which we expect, like you know, actual designs, actual bugs, actual documentation. Again, life was good, sort of, for the other side in the room, not for us. So we had defined them their timelines. We had given them essentially what they had to do. We told them, now you know, go ahead, start doing things. What ended up happening? We had given them static timelines. We told them, here you have your findings, you have your reports, you have everything. You have these many days, start fixing them. Now what happens is essentially in a normal agile environment, you have releases happening very frequently, very often, very quickly. You have your findings being accumulated now. So normally, 30 days would have earlier meant that in those times you would normally make, maybe make one release if you're really quick, but normally, Nothing would normally happen in the next 90 days. In this case, you had four releases within 30 days. This led to essentially four sets of findings being now accumulated over 30 days. So now, earlier, you just had one high over one release. Now, over four releases, you have now essentially accumulated five high findings. And you have no idea what to do with them. Fun times. <sighs> this essentially made things go really, really wrong. Even more so for organizations who started wanting to move from the waterfall model into the agile development model. In their cases, they not only had to deal with the growing pains or not of moving from one development site to another, they also had to deal with the fact that now the more frequent the releases were coming, they were coming up with more findings, things were coming, essentially getting into a whole lot of mess. So what did we do? We decided that development now needed to also move the remediation process into a more agile method, so to speak. So we came up with what we call the remediation in the box. Essentially a whole remediation process fitted to their de uh, uh, development environment. All you needed to do was maybe add water and maybe some alcohol. Second would work better. We essentially divided their remediation into essentially four phases. We call them identification, prioritization, essentially fixing, and verification. These marked up well with their development timelines, essentially their pre-planning, their planning, their actual development, and their retrospective. So the identification was not more so about actually finding the bug, but now essentially taking those bugs and doing something about them. Now, when you actually get a bug, we Earlier, it used to be essentially just filed as that and just uh, fixing them. Unfortunately, a finding is not necessarily always a bug. It can be lot, lots of things. It can be something completely screwed up with your application as in your design itself. Maybe if you were a bank and you handled uh, transactions it, and accounts, it was something related to moving money from one account to another, in which case it would not just be a bug. It would be something which you did not want to release your application with. People did, Citibank, Anyone remember that one? So what we did, we tried to treat it as most agile environments do. We made stories out of them. You have, earlier you used to have, for product features, you have normal stories. You have where essentially they are going, hey, the user wants to do this, 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 this. You make a story out of it, and then apparently you let the development teams run with it. In our case, we essentially, what we would do, we would take the finding, and we would make an attacker story out of it. And then essentially let things be driven from that perspective. So we would have 
hey, we have a cross-site scripting. So your attacker story would end up becoming the attacker should not be able to inject arbitrary script into your page. Normally easy enough. Of course, no, it wasn't. Life would not be that easy, unfortunately for us. So once you make those stories, you essentially have to have the follow-up. But the primary advantage that you got out of these was that finally you had a basis on which your whole process could go upon. You had actual story based upon which you could start building your test cases up. You had stories about which your designs could now be formalized and you could actually have people writing more code to it. Prioritization. This was the second most fun part of it. Now in the waterfall environment, life was again slightly easier. You had high findings, they remained high, they stuck to that till somebody fixed it, in which case you would go ahead, shut them down, everything's cool, everything's done. Life was again good. Now, in our in an agile environment, what ends up happening, you have multiple releases, you have things getting put into backlog, they start getting deprioritized, you essentially start losing resolution. At that point, essentially, what ends up happening, you have a pile of findings, they keep getting thrown back, 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 till at some point, you are able to do nothing at all with any of them. And someday, somebody breaks into your application and then somebody will say, hey, why didn't we ever look at this? So, in the new environment, what we end up doing is that we separate out our severities from our prioritizations. We essentially let the severity be on it and we essentially give the prioritization, align that with the temporal risk. So essentially what ends up happening, the longer the finding stays, the higher the essentially risk it attributes. And you essentially apply a similar level of severity to it. In this case, I said sprint. It would all depend on essentially what would be your release cadence. So essentially if you have a sprintly release cadence, if in the first sprint your priority was low, next sprint it would increase by a level. In the next one, at this point if it's still there, you should just stop and fix this. Because at this point, it, even it should become for all intents and purposes a sub-zero. And of course, finally, the actual fixing portion. Now in this case, it becomes a very development-focused activity. At this point, it becomes important that essentially a develop, uh, developer understands how to go about fixing it, essentially, and be able to actually map it into their process. Now, we, sorry. Now in this case, normally you have your stock guidance being provided to the developer. Again, going back to our old waterfall days, you have our checklists, you have our sheets, you have a hundred page documents showing how to fix what and how to do what. Life is good on that. But again, what we have this being done is that now we have these being driven through our attacker stories. So we have the earlier user stories where essentially you had unit tests being built over that. You essentially could fix it and get it into your more of a test driven development methodology where essentially people, wrote, uh, people could write the initial test case based on the story till they essentially fulfilled it. In case of the attacker, sto attacker based stories, you essentially did exactly the reverse. You essentially had your test case essentially passing till you actually could get it to fail. So essentially, if you could get a field, you would get it to put into an injection, you essentially get your, to your test case onto it, and you essentially kept going at it till it no longer worked. Essentially, this, was, this is much harder to work upon, and on this front, normally, more, more than stock guidance, you essentially need to be driven through actual education and actual remediation guidance. But building a test case normally, in this case, formalizes things for them, gets it into their process, and gets an actual SSG off their backs gets them to fix things. Now, verification. Now this is probably the most hardest part in any remediation cycle. So we'll probably be spending the most amount of time. Now your standard problem with remediation cycles ends up happening is that there are two things. One, A, whether the fix is put in or not. Because, hell, somebody fixed it, you don't know whether it was done. Secondly, whether it was done properly or not. In this case, lots of people do lots of things to fix lots of things. Um, what leads to? Not necessarily the right thing always. 
if somebody essentially has a cross-site scripting and decides, hey, I'm just going to put up a JavaScript, which will essentially block this. Yeah, sure, that would work. Till essentially some genius figures it out that I don't need to do that anymore. So on this point, essentially what it ends up happening is that not only your verification cycle gets locked upon, it essentially gets static. Now in a waterfall mode, normally a lot of these things can be caught much ahead. It can essentially be caught during development itself, while you're essentially doing through your static analysis processes. In the QA mode, you can essentially have actual manual test cases being built for this, which can essentially lead to further refinement. In the more faster development methodologies, you essentially have to make it a little more faster, a little more integrated, and if possible, a lot more automated. So essentially, what en ends up happening is that you put in stock, again, uh, verification up ahead earlier, and follow it up with essentially manual verification depending on the type of finding it was. So normally, what would happen in a more st uh, static analysis, automated based finding, you would essentially rerun those tests essentially within those cycles themselves. So if you had a finding which came from a static analysis report, you essentially ran the, it during development itself as a test case itself. So what would end up happening? You have immediate feedback based upon the finding that you had. What that leads to is essentially you don't have to go back to another party every single time to carry out your verification. And essentially it becomes internalized. Now it does not necessarily lead to a full scale formalized verification, but what does lead to is a reduction in the time that people take to do this. So if some fellow actually goes ahead and does it wrong, they know how to do it, go back and do it right again. Now, this again has to be broken up across depending on what sort of a finding it is. And normally, each of your processes will focus on a different aspect of it. An automated portion would focus on the stock aspect of it. A manual portion would more focus on the creative aspect of it. If you had application logic bypass, there's not a lot, a lot of automated tools can do for you. But at that point, essentially, you would have manual verifier. Now, life is good at that point. Unfortunately, what can also happen is that you lose focus on any one of these. So what you do? You essentially try and pair up each of these along with the different pieces of your cycle. So if you have, say, a static, you have a process scripting. Now, it was, it was found through a penetration test. Fine. It didn't happen through automated. It didn't happen through a static. It didn't happen through a dynamic. What you do? You essentially let each of the phases carry out their own. So within the first de development phase itself, you let the static analysis happen upon your findings, upon your actual fixes, and essentially let that determine. If not, you then continue. You build up your security test cases. In some, it's hard. In some, it just is a lot of work and a lot of things being developed, but not very difficult. And the final is the manual testing portion. This is what finally leads to the actual slowdown in your process and would lead to the maximum amount of resistance. But there are some things which unfortunately you can't do anyway, so this is what you have to stick to. Okay. Now, we brought up a remediation dish. We essentially put in some water, we came up with this nice little thing. But the problem is it never exists on its own. So you normally have to also push this on to people who don't understand any of this. So you come up with fancy words. In our case, three words you can come up with. You can also put in more. But these three are very effective, since these are also very trendy. We call it integration, automation, education. Education is relatively easy. We essentially say, if your developers know how to fix this, they don't have to come back, go back to a third consulting party every single time to essentially say, hey, tell us how to do it. So you focus more on education. The more they know, the less they do. Something I'm sure I'll copy that from NBC. Going ahead. In this case, what also it leads to is that in future, you have less of these findings actually occurring. Again, a very plus point considering that you don't want to waste your cycles on actually fixing things rather than you just want to fix, focus on building them. Education is probably one of the biggest ones which helps with that. Again, the more they do things right, the less they screw up. Automation. Now, automation becomes a very, very, is a very, very important portion for Agile. 
In terms of security, however, we are often not so diligent on applying it. And when we essentially get a more, more of the automated processes into our automated security processes into our agile development, it essentially leads to, again, fa those findings, A, coming faster, and more importantly, the ver verification and the remediation essentially happening faster in that as well. And the final word, integration. Uh, frankly, I have no idea what that means. Uh, but essentially, what ends up happening is that in integration, normally it would mean, in a simpler word, is that you have more cross-functional groups working together and more cross-functional applications working together, actually. So instead of just having, say, one security tool lying on one hand and essentially a development tracking system lying on the other, you essentially have them integrated where essentially it leads to direct feed into your actual bug tracking systems. On the essentially uh, organizational front, you essentially this would mean that you would have more security related people essentially actually sitting within your development teams, essentially security coordinators, but not essentially program managers, people who would actually understand the code and essentially people who can actually apply those, all those lessons learned directly into the team. And of course, finally, all this is nice and good, but one of the first things that you would need before we go ahead is that you would need a relatively strong software security group actually working with these development teams. Normally for them to work in a vacuum, even for something as simple as remediation, becomes very hard unless they have actual support groups behind them. Evangelization becomes, again, a very, very, very important factor for them. The, after, even after build process, even after you build things, even after you present huge pieces of documentation, it becomes very important that people actually understand them, know about them before they can go ahead and adopt them. And finally, uh, the biggest resistance that you will always have will be from people who actually want to make money out of these things, uh, who want to say, I want my product out there. I want it to make money. I don't care if there is a security issue with it. Normally, that's a bit extreme. Normally, they would just say, I would just want to make money. So on these cases, normally it's very important that the people who actually own the product pay for it, bring it out of their budgets, understand that they are the ones who actually fix it and go ahead with it. Now, I did promise I will keep this painless. So in conclusion, water might not be enough. Um, you might need some caffeine and alcohol with it. Just don't put them together. Thank you, and I will take questions. Shortest presentation ever. Please. Um, so one of the issues I'm struggling with or thinking about a lot is uh, in terms of not, not just the vulnerability finding process, but the um, kind of building security in from the get-go and how to work better with, with rapid development teams and agile teams to do that. And in particular, like I have, you know, teams that are working with, they want to develop what they call a minimum viable product, MVP, and oftentimes that minimal viable product does not include security, it's not a secure product. And so my question is, you know, in terms of doing that level of STLC integration, do you have any um, recommendations or suggestions on how to to kind of work with, with such a team to, to kind of to build, our, to build security in at the architectural level and so forth? So normally with the minimum viable products, you will have that essentially it comes out of a single product story. So normally your, something, it will come from something as simple as a product owner going, I want them to make change their name. So at that time essentially a developer would go, they would make that particular change and you would have your minimum viable product out of it. Or rather than this minimum viable feature. So normally the best way to go about it is normally integrate an actual architectural change with the product owner itself. So when you have essentially a minimum viable product, it doesn't work for us. So we don't wait till they actually come up with the minimum viable product. We make sure that it's actually first within the, within the perspective of the actual product feature itself, we essentially assign our security modifications and our security features and our security requirements. So what ends up happening? You have the minimum viable product, but it's not, the minimum is not classified within the perspective of just the product. It's classified in terms of security as well. So what ends up happening, you don't say that the product is minimum 
still you just meet these features. You have to meet these as well. At that point, it can be considered minimum viable, so to speak. for a startup to come up with essentially the resources to set up a software security group on its own. And frankly, we don't expect that always. Which is why normally what ends up happening, and this is essentially when we go back, when we went back to our last portion, which was the actual verification mode of it. it what it required was essentially a one person normally, who normally happens to understand the product, but also has a security background we integrated. So what they are able to do is that they are able to drive a large portion of the automation portion. So you can't now, as a security person within a startup, one person, you can't have an army of pen testers going after the application. You can't have an army of security architects going after it. So essentially what you end up doing is that you, off you end up offloading a lot of this work to people who might not be security related, but who might be able to follow it. So on your front, on your front, essentially you go ahead and say, I'll, I'll, I'll build these things for you. you. I will essentially make sure that you have this remediation in the box. I will have, you will have the guidance. You will have this. You follow it and essentially I'll support you on that. So at the end of the day, what you end up doing is that you end up playing more of a supporting role. And essentially you do the best with what you have at that point. Please. Uh, what is the most difficult aspect of this thing? I'm sorry? Other than budget and buy-in from the other teams, what is the most difficult aspect of integrating a program like this? So one of the most difficult things other than budget and buy-in is actual follow-ups. The thing is that you will build in a process. Everything is fine. You, they accepted it. They went ahead with it. But at some point, what, we, what will end up happening is that if there is not sufficient amount of follow-up, there is no sufficient, all right, you will have people tapering off. You will have people changing the process to what suits the product again. So you will always have what can be considered a spring back. So what will happen? You build in the process, you give them this nice little flow chart of what to do. They will essentially go ahead and at some point suddenly you come back after a year and you find that doesn't exist anymore because it was slowing down the development. Excellent. Thank you.